what what they did here, they, they took some soil from uh, pots where they added uh, no am amendment. They added gypsum, which is often used to manage acidicity, uh, an organic amendment uh, treatment where they added both organic matter and gypsum or organic matter and nutrients. And what they measured was the aggregate stability or aggregate size. So basically what you need to uh, realise here as as the aggregate stability increases, you get better soil structure. And what, what this graph here clearly demonstrates when you add sort of traditional millions <coughs> of gypsum or organic matter, or in this case, both organic matter and gypsum, you get this massive increase or fourfold increase in soil structure. Uh, this is some work from uh, colleagues, Peter Sales Group at uh, La Trobe University. What we'll have here on the top uh, uh, level here is he had an experiment where they added different treatments, so a control with no amendment, one where they just added nutrients, another one where they added uh, wheat straw and nutrients, another one nutrient enriched organic matter in the form of poultry litter, or another poultry litter sort of commercially available uh, product called Macrocoat to the soil. That in that soil they had either they planted wheat plants or had no plants, and what they hear on the uh, y-axis you can see is the uh, number of large macro aggregates. So increasing number means improvement in soil structure. And what what this data here basically showed is I think the two things I want to go away from here is where you added your best sort of soil aggregation occurred where you had sort of both an organic matter and nutrients or nutrient enriched organic matter source. But the other really in both the uh, where the amendment was added, but even more so uh, in the subsoil layer. But the other really interesting thing was where you had a plant. So in one, one set of pots, they, they just added the treatments here. Another one, they added the treatments plus they planted. You can see that sort of dramatic improvement by the presence of the plant itself. And basically what this graph is saying is, you know, this is evidence to back up that comment I made that there seems to be a synergistic interaction or beneficial interaction between the presence of a plant and these different organic matter treatments. What they believe part of the reason for that uh, uh, synergistic benefit of adding the plant and the organic amendment is, this is a, a graph here of fungal abundance in those soils. So fungi, mycorrhizal, particularly mycorrhizal fungi, what you can see here is that that improvement in soil structure, macroaggregation here is strongly related to the presence of fungal abundance in the soil. Uh, part, of, part of the work, sort of extension from uh, particularly the DAV 49 work is we, we see the greatest, generally see the the greatest need and also the greatest benefits from uh, application nutrient enriched organic matter in the high rainfall zone. So I'm talking about the high rainfall zone cropping areas of uh, southern Victoria, but there's large areas in southern New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia. And this, this is typical scene where you have uh, often this situation can arise where you have sodic topsoils. You don't need to have a lot of rain to produce this ponding effect because of the poor soil structure, but in a large number of areas throughout Southern Victoria, there's just obviously an excess of rainfall over evaporation. And what we're, we've done in this experiment here, so this is, this is a glasshouse experiment where we had uh, uh, four different treatments here, I'm just presenting three of them, where we've added no amendment, one where we've added uh, nutrient-rich organic matter, and, terms of uh, chicken manure pellets or another one where we added a slow release nitrogen fertilizer and what we did there we, we subject those we grew wheat after adding those different amendments and uh, we either subject those plants to several weeks of water logging so in this bucket here you can basically what we have here is one of these cores they put in the bucket and the water levels like that they kept waterlogged for about two or three weeks. So a very common situation in Southern Victoria. 
And I think the big things come out here, you can see the water logging effects. So compare that this control plant here, it's green, it's healthy, much larger biomass compared to the control. Uh, but even more so where we've added uh, nutrient enriched organic matter. So if you're looking at a waterlogged situation and under a dry land condition, you, you, you're getting a benefit to adding that organic matter and to a lesser extent nitrogen fertilizer. But even under the waterlogged conditions, you're getting this much better growth uh, by adding the nutrient rich organic matter. Can, if you compare that treatment, that one there or that one there. And that's evidenced by some of the, the this is just grain yield here. So again, under waterlogged conditions, so for the control, for the NTEC urea fertilizer, for foliar and or organic matter, if you look at the control, uh, so that's uh, non waterlogged you're getting a big yield response to almost like a nitrogen effect across here, whether it's foliar and uh, slow release and organic matter. But in contrast, under waterlogging conditions, that benefit to growth by adding the nutrient enriched organic matter is significantly better than where you're adding either slow release fertilizer. Uh, foliar fertilizer, sorry, uh, slow release fertilizer control. So what we attributed that to is under waterlogged conditions that nutrient rich organic matter is just providing both a better supply of nitrogen, but also in these soils, better soil structure that's helping to overcome that sort of anaerobic conditions in that waterlogged soil. I'll just briefly now for the rest of the talk outline some of the work in the, the broader project. So what I've got here is uh, we've, we've been undertaking field trials now for the last three years, or we're actually in the fourth year, throughout southern New South Wales, uh, South Australia, Tasmania, and also in Victoria. So we've got actually three sites in Victoria, one near Tadeoon, which is the southwest of Ararat, one at Kyatta, which is halfway, it's a medium rainfall zone site, uh, halfway between uh, Horsham and Mill. Uh, a lot of the work, what I'll do here is present particularly results from the RAND site in southern New South Wales. So it's it's a high rainfall. RAND, Tadeoon, Nile, and Maribel are what we term cropping industry high rainfall. So typically average more than 550 mils rainfall annually per year. And what I'll do is, what, what this project was all about is trying to improve soil structure and overcome a range of soil constraints. And I'll, I'll just give a sort of outline. These are soil profiles. If you look at the uh, depth here, we're going down to about a metre, one, one to 1 1.2 metres in soil. And if you look at, you know, this is typical soil around Tadeoon, uh, reasonably, you know, quite low levels of VC, so that's conductivity or salinity. Not very sodic in the topsoil, the acid, topsoil is not very acid. But once you start getting down in the subsoil, it's highly alkaline subsoil, there's a moderate amount of salinity there and the sodicity has gone up to 15, so it's sort of highly sodic. Uh, there's a similar situation, uh, uh, the soil from RAND, so it's not sodic in the topsoil, not acid, but once you start going to the subsoil, really highly alkaline, so pH is in water greater than nine, and sodicity around 29. Uh, I thought this, these pictures, profiles here, particularly interest, so I suspect around, I don't know the Macedon area that well, but if it's, you get water logging, point there, can you see that sort of bleach uh, zone, buckshot zone? In the soil there, it's not as obvious around Tadeoon because of the quality of the picture, but it's really good picture there of Nile. And that sort of bleach zone results from repeated water logging over you know, hundreds of years. So these are some results uh, from field trials. So often, what we this, this is what the large this is site at uh, Ararat or Tadeoon looks like. Uh, Here's some treatment differences, control where we've got subsoil amelioration. And, and this is the machinery we use in Victoria to uh, apply you know, different organic matter, nutrient or gypsum treatments. But what I'll do in this graph here, this is uh, uh, looking at grain yield responses to different amelioration treatments. So the, those treatments uh, in the blue is control, 
This is one where we just deep rip the soil. Another one where we applied gypsum at depth. So that was about seven tonnes per hectare of gypsum. The yellow is deep nutrients. So combination of nitrogen and phosphorus at placed at depth. Uh, stripe line here is what I call neom. And again, I must apologise if neom is what I refer to as nutrient rich organic matter. So it could be, for example, chicken or poultry, manure pellets. Uh, this is uh, that neom applied just to the topsoil. One here is green chop. In this case, this was loosened pellets and uh, applied to either subsoil or the topsoil. Uh, what I've got here is relative grain yield, and that's relative is. Uh, we've had the control treatment, so where there's no amendments listed as 100%, so that's why all those lines are at 100%. And these numbers here are refer to the actual grain yield of the control treatment. So at Tadioon, we had a 6.3 tonne per hectare wheat crop. At uh, Maribel, it's a relatively dry year, there was uh, about 0.6 tonnes a hectare of faba beans. Uh, for Rand, 1.6 tonnes of barley. And at the Nile site, 2.8 tonnes a hectare of barley. But what I want people to come away from here is those grain yield responses compared to the control range from about 16% uh, at Tadiyun to 270% or more at the Maribel site in South Australia, uh, around about 60% at RAM in southern New South Wales to the deep nutrient rich organic matter and similar values are slightly higher at Nile in, in, in Tasmania. At Nile it was unusual, it's, uh, it was one site where the sort of nutrients alone, deep nutrients alone were sort of equivalent to the yields we achieved with the nutrient rich organic matter. But that wasn't the case at either Maribel or uh, at Rand. So that was the first year after those uh, application of the uh, different soil humiliation treatments. Uh, this is a site from uh, just a visual picture of the site from Nile in uh, northern Tasmania. So you can see the control strip here where there's no emollients, one where there's just deep nutrients. Next to it is deep manure, deep loosen, deep wheat straw and nutrients. This one here is a rip treatment. So the reason we have a rip treatment is if you're, we, we need to rip the subsoil to apply either loosen or nutrients at depth. So it effectively, uh, we want to make sure that the response is to the emollient, not to the ripping process. And what you can see from here is generally, if you rip and don't add emollients, you get no yield response. Or sometimes if it's a low rainfall zone, you actually get a negative response to the ripping only. Uh, these treatments here where the nutrient rich organic matter is just applied to the surface treatments there. So that's what it looks like in the field. Uh, these are results from the second year after application. Uh, again, similar relative yield control is 100%. Uh, yields here are the control yields. So at Ararat, uh, sorry, Maribel is wheat, 3.1 tonnes a hectare. Nile, 3 tonnes a hectare of canola. Ran, southern New South Wales, 2.4 tonnes a hectare of canola and uh, 7.2 tonne hectare barley crop at Ararat. Uh, unfortunately, at Ararat, there was no treatment responses, but again, if you look at the other sites, particularly uh, the Tasmanian and southern New South Wales sites, you're getting consistent yield responses ranging from about 20 to over 30%. Uh, and what I need to point out here, these are the growing season rainfall amounts. So uh, what we found at both Maribel, that was effectively about a decile two year. It was a really dry year by their standards. Uh, Nile was more in keeping. It was quite a, a dry year at Rand. So 216 mils of growing season rainfall, that's probably about decile two. So the lowest 20% of years and Nile barley that that was uh, Ararat that was a, a decile five growing season rainfall. So again, sort of at uh, three of the sites, highly statistically significant responses to soil humiliation. Just thought I'd put this figure in. This is uh, uh, an NDRE image. So I'm um, using a multispectral camera collected with a, a UAV over our site at Ararat. 
these numbers here refer to the plots. And what I wanted to show here is uh, basically if you look at the NDREs like ND, uh, NDVI, so the, as you go from uh, a low value around those sort of purple color there up to yellow, you're getting increase. What NDRE is a function of both uh, chlorophyll and biomass, so that those treatments there have uh, significantly better higher bi crop biomass. I think this was a wheat crop from memory uh, there. So just give an example, some treatments here. So let's look at uh, what's plot 31. So that's uh, that was deep nutrients. 32 was um, looking at the graph here, 32 was deep ripping only. So often what we're seeing a negative response to deep ripping. Similarly up here, what's 12? That That is deep nutrients. 11 is uh, deep loosen. 13 is, what, 13 is, where's 13? Deep organic matter. And we compare that to control. This is a control plot here. So what we're seeing here is those sort of amelioration treatments, significantly better crop growth. Uh, following the application. I think the reason I, I, I showed this picture is, is one of the problems you have with field experimentation on these sort of uh, sodic dispersive soils. This this plot here, this is an outline there of a, what is supposed to be a uniform treatment, but you can see the extent of the natural spatial variability within that plot, and that's reflecting variability in the underlying soil type there. And this is the, the headlands outside there, so you can see there just the natural spatial variability. Uh, why are we getting these improvements in grain yields? Uh, what we found is consistently they're relinked to increased subsoil water use. So this here is uh, going down the soil profile, there's a neutron probe count. So basically as you go from left to right on that x-axis, you're getting greater soil water. This is measurements taken at harvest. So what you want, if there was no subsoil constraint, you basically you'd want as low water as possible in the profile, because that indicates the crops made use of all that subsoil water. So this is a control treatment here, the one in black, and you compare it to say treatments such as the uh, deep pea hay at, at the RAND site, so it's uh, just using natural pea hay, hay and similar with deep pea hay, gypsum nutrients. And see how that soil emollients resulted much, at any one depth, much greater use of subsoil water. That soil water averaged around about 10 to 15 percent extra subsoil water. Uh, I think it was so, and that subsoil water is probably much more effective increasing grain yields and the wort soil water you have in the topsoil. Why are you getting that improvement in subsoil water use resulting from ameliation? So this is a graph showing the number of observed roots down the soil profile, so from soil surface down to a metre deep. What you can see here, particularly when you start looking at the layers where the emollients added, so this is normally add the emollient around 30 centimetres. This is a deep organic matter nutrient treatment there, you compare that to a control uh, surface, you know, uh, deep ripping only, or, oh, sorry, deep ripping. And what you're seeing here is this marked improvement in the number of roots observed around where the emollient is. And I've just look at, I don't know if it's visible in the picture here, but you're looking at about 30 centimetres, can you see that proliferation of roots into the subsoil and in the ripping channel there? Uh, this is just some work again from our colleagues. Uh, so this is a picture from previous graph here. This one here is just a picture of saturated flow. So what we're seeing here is you know, point to the orange graph here where you've added control, ripping, adding gypsum at depth for gypsum uh, organic matter of nutrients at depths. And what we're seeing here is uh, significant improvements in the rate of rainfall infiltration into the topsoil. Uh, I've already touched on a bit, a bit about machinery, so I'm not sure if anyone here is associated with Southern Farming Systems, but this is what we refer to the Rennick Perez machine. So this machine was built about 15 years ago. Uh, that's how we'd get 
uh, they would get the sort of nutrient-rich organic matter treatments in the subsoil, your two deep ripping tines, add the organic matter there, and you've got someone, uh, oh and nightmare, trying to push that down into the soil. But these are some of the more recent machinery. So this is the Victorian Agriculture Victorian machine, machine from Queensland DPI. This is the Wagga machine, a really, uh, really good experimental machines. Uh, but more recently, there's been some commercial scale machinery developed. So this machine here belongs to a, a farmer from Francis on the Victorian South Australian border. He got some funding uh, support from uh, Sustainability Vic and he has built his own machine to apply these amendments at the farm scale. And this is the mach uh, machine from Yellick Estate near Balan. They've uh, subsoiled manure their whole farm. I think this is something like a couple of thousand hectares where they've, they've applied uh, up to about 20 tonnes a hectare of uh, nutrient rich organic matter into the subsoil. I uh, realise I'm running out of time, so just very quickly, what we're part of this analysis, we're playing quite a strong attention to the economics. As I said earlier, uh, one of the troubles with uh, constraint subsoil manuring, it often can cost up to about $1,400 a hectare to implement this treatment. But some of the initial economic analysis undertaken by uh, Bill Malcolm and his group at uh, University of Melbourne is basically often, if you get the right grain yields, that, that, that soil subsoil amelioration can pay for itself within about two to three years. I just thought I'd briefly touch on some recent work we're doing in Agriculture Victoria. Uh, what we're looking here, this is, these are sort of satellite images showing the NDVI, so Net uh, Education Index of commercial paddocks. So that, that paddock there is west of Warwick, Nabil in the Wimmera. That's a 200 hectare paddock there, so quite large scale. And what we're showing here is that's crop growth. You can see the natural variability in crop growth occurring there. This is a paddock near North Kong. Uh, in the West Wimmera, again, very large amount of those different colours correspond to differences in crop growth. If you take one site there, so we take the Norkong site there, this is what, if you look at the surface, uh, this area here, it's relatively uniform surface. But when you start looking at each of those points there, so point 0.1, point 0.26, what you can see here is that sort of large spatial variability that can occur in a soil naturally occurring in a paddock. Uh, so what we're trying to do at present is using various soil and crop sensing techniques to help try and identify the, uh, that natural variability in soils and therefore soil constraints and so we can better target the application of uh, subsoil manuring to those paddocks. Uh, so just key points to date from the work. Uh, I won't go on the first one. Second one, what, what we're seeing is uh, in medium rainfall zone or a lot of environments, we're, we're getting a negative effect if you just deep rip alone without adding any ameliorant, particularly uh, uh, if the, you've got relatively dry years. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of response to initially to organic amelioration medium rainfall zone sites. So there's sites around about 400 mils annual rainfall or less. And a lot of that's because of the deep, you know, deep ripping effect. However, where we have high rainfall zone environments, we're, we're seeing anything up to after, over the first or second year, up to about, you know, in some cases, a 300% yield response uh, in those sites. Uh, we find that if you just apply the emollient to the topsoil, you tend to get the uh, topsoil surface application, you tend to get the best response in year one. But from year two and onwards, so we're in the second, second, third year of the trial now, we're seeing our largest responses, resp grain yield responses to amelioration, to subsoil amelioration. Uh, as a general rule, uh, pulses, so grain legumes, appear to be more responsive to subsoil amelioration than cereals. And so that's, we're not 100% sure of that, but generally your pulses, their roots are much more sensitive to subsoil constraints. Uh, no one amelioration treatment is consistently the best, but as a general rule, 
if you've got a nutrient enriched organic matter such as you know pig manure chick manure they'll tend to produce the best yield responses those yield responses are associated with improved soil water use as a result of improved root growth and potential tolerance to waterlogging in the subsoil. Uh, what we suspect is that response to nutrient-rich organic matter tends to be initially a, a response to nutrients contained in that organic matter, but from about second and third year onwards, we believe that there's improved soil structure uh, is resulting in the yield responses. There's still some uncertainty about that. Uh, the long-term effects, we don't know. We're three years into the project, but we've got funding now to go for five years. <coughs> Uh, looking at opportunity to use sort of remote sensors to measure crop responses to these emollients. And I, I thought I'd finish on this graph here is, to date we mentioned the logistical constraint is that there's not enough animal manures available to subsoil manure or the cropping land in Victoria, but to date we've had uh, really promising results where we've combined cereal straw, some wheat or barley with nutrients, Alternatively, we did some work uh, in collaboration with uh, Sustainability Victoria where we used recycled green waste uh, attained locally. There's something like 2 million tonnes of it in Melbourne or each shire council, it's a major problem what to do with the green waste. And in some cases that recycled green waste is just as effective as the animal manures. On that note, thank you. Thank you, Roger. That's great. And I'll, uh, there has been a few questions that have come through. But while I give you a a uh, couple of seconds to um, to just take a take a break. Um, I will just share with you. Um, What's coming up in our webinars? So we have next week next week off, but the following uh, three Tuesdays, where we've got some local farmers to, talking about their journey in holistic farming. And if you want to join that, just go to the same same page that you've been on, or 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 go to um, the events page on the Macedon Ranger Shire. For residents of the Mason Ranger Shire and Upper Colburn catchments, you're able to access um, some free one-to-one -one practical support on your property around grazing management, um, uh, delivered by myself, and the regenerative grazing short course coming up in October 2020. Again, have a look um, on our website for that. Just a reminder for those of you that have joined us through this series that in late October, um, if you've gone out and done uh, a soil test, uh, we will hopefully have Rebecca back to talk about how to understand your soil tests that you have received. Now, on to some questions. So hopefully you can can see these questions, Roger. Uh, I dare all. From my screen sharing. Yep. All right. Yep. Yep. So the first question: Can you explain how sodic soils don't have to be saline? If I understand correctly, sodic soils have to have a high, have high salt levels. From that's from Grant. Okay. So basically, when we talk about sodic soil, it's the amount of exchangeable sodium in relation to the total amount of exchangeable cations. So um, if you've got a high amount of, say, calcium in that soil contributing to your exchange complex, calcium's good. It, it helps sort of improve soil structure. And in fact, it's, it's the main component of gypsum. Uh, when we talk about sodic soil, so you can have, there's different, you can have both a non-sodic and sodic soil. and the, and similarly, you can have a saline soil that's not sodic, or you can have both a saline and sodic soil. Uh, salinity basically tends to 
if you're looking at dispersion, counteract the effect of sedicity. So that petri dish I, I graph I showed you, if you had used tap water, which contains chloride and therefore some extent of uh, salinity, it will tend to override that dispersion effect. So all the, the clay particles will basically just uh, precipitate out. So I hope that answers your question, Grant. How suitable is horse manure? Uh, we've never worked with horse manure, but I'd say it's on the principle that it's uh, nutrient rich, often will contain a lot of uh, carbon. Yep, I'd, I'd be surprised if it uh, doesn't work as, if it is, if it's not equally as good as chicken or poultry litter. I suppose the only question I've got is at a commercial scale, if you're adding 20 tonnes a hectare of uh, this million, that's a lot of horses. Just better go to Flemington to grab it. Uh, yep. What is the rate of gypsum per hectare that you've used, I assume? Uh, in our soils in the medium rainfall zone sites, we've applied five tonnes a hectare. Uh, in the high rainfall zone sites I showed you today, that's seven tonnes a hectare. Uh, that amount of gypsum is insufficient to completely counteract the effect of sedicity. When you have really high rates of sedicity, you, you potentially would have to add you know, 30 or 40 tonnes a hectare of gypsum. The trouble is you start getting a salt effect of adding that gypsum and it, it, it tends then to be counter uh, productive, you improve soil structure, but yeah, it, it's there's negative side. Yeah, it's just not economic to have that, that sort of high rates of gypsum. Most, most uh, I need to add, most uh, commercial farmers lease in the cropping zone that they'll regularly top dress with gypsum every two to three years. Normally, the year before that, they put in a canola crop, but those rates often ran about two to three tonnes a hectare of gypsum. So having bare soil is not good for the soil? That's a question from uh, Mark. So I think the basic principle there is for any agricultural system, you, you want to have sort of as much cover, cropping cover as possible. Yep. Yeah, that's fairly standard, Mark, through a lot of the a lot of the talk the stuff that we talk about with grazing as well as with the cropping, we, we want to have something covering that soil at all time. Uh, what are the contributing factors in the experiment do you think are indicators of the different results? You probably went through this uh, as, as you went. Yeah, I'm just trying to think what experiment. Uh, so I suppose we're looking at humiliation treatments. The, the overriding one we're finding about the effectiveness of uh, any soil humiliation treatment, soil water availability, its rainfall is always number one. Uh, I think I've mentioned we, we've seen an interaction between uh, uh, initially the experience between nutrition and improved soil structure. Uh, the other factor we've found is where we've tended to get a negative treatment responses, so particularly to deep ripping is what we found is if you just rip and don't ameliorate the soil and you don't get sufficient rainfall afterwards to consolidate the seed bed, you get poor crop establishment and that uh, that sort of effect continues throughout the rest of the season. So I think it was in relation to, and uh, Mark's just added here, the different locations. Oh, well, th those different locations. Uh, They've got different crops in some of those locations yeah, as well. I mean. Yeah, so in terms of, yeah, there are different crops. Uh, the two South, the South Australian sites at Maribel, that they've basically had two shocking years there. Uh, the site at Ararat, or at Tadiun near there, is we, we, we had expected much bigger yield responses there than we thought. We're not sure why we're not getting the magnitude of yield responses that we're seeing in other sites. Uh, that soil is moderately uh, salon dispersive. It's not really highly dispersive such as the RAND site, but yeah, uh, I think the issue about these uh, 
kind of work is you need to run them over a number of years. So we're only into the third year at that site at Ararat, but we had expected to get bigger yield responses there than we had to date. And we are disappointed that we haven't seen that sort of treatment responses. The next question, um, Amanda's informed me that you've already answered, but you can quickly go on to how, how, uh, so how, how, how is the deep? organic matter and nutrients supplied at depth? So those yeah. different machines, machine from either, you know, Wagga, from the AgVic one or uh, the ones in Queensland, basically we have uh, deep ripping tines. They often, the ripping tines are set anywhere between 50 and 80 centimetres apart. And we basically, the nature, we've been using pelletised organic matter or granular fertiliser, basically we just, Put them down for a shoot at the back of the tine, and generally, you know, in the case of Victoria, we place that organic matter or nutrients or gypsum in about 30 centimetre depth. In the New South Wales colleagues, they've been placing it between about 40 and 50 centimetres depth. And then, okay, the next question there seems to be a strong response to surface um, organic matter applications, which is much easier. So, you, you then went on to explain that it's, there is a response in the first year, but you're not seeing it. Is, are you still putting on the organic matter year on year? Is that part of the- I oh, know, so, so in terms of economics, I should have pointed that out, that those those initial treatments are applied as a once off. So we're, what we're doing, so they're, they're applied, say in the case of the Victorian sites in April 2018, and what we'll be doing is looking at the residual value of those treatments over five years. Uh, if, if the re reason the residual value is really important, you'd need, if you're investing anywhere, say between $1,000, $1,400 a hectare to put these treatments in, you know, by the time you count from machinery, the time, feed source, etc., cetera, uh, it's quite an expensive exercise. So you'd need really big yield responses or treatment responses to make that pay in the first year. But what we're, you know, some of the economic analysis has been done, some of the earlier work in Victoria, particularly by Peter Sales Group is, at least in the higher rainfall zone, after about two to three years, those treatments were often paying for themselves and anything after that's profit. Uh, just, the question um, about surface application of treatments. Uh, yep, that, that was a big issue I had when we first started it is, you know, be blunt, if you're placing large amounts of organic matter or gypsum or nutrients in the subsoil, that is both financially and logistically a pain in the neck. Uh, so we did see our best responses to uh, treatments were the surface application, but what we're starting to see now after two to three years is that those, uh, the treatment responses to the subsoil application are greater than those in the surface. Now, whether so, there's a range of confounding factors there, whether it's sort of rainfall, water availability or treatment, but what we suspect is, uh, I made the comment about the mode of action of this treatment tends to be initially to a nutritional effect, so that could explain the initial significant response is the surface application of nutrient-rich organic matter. Maybe it's just nitrogen or phosphorus in the surface, but when you apply this material to the subsoil, because you start, it, it tends to be a, a biologically mediated process. So I made the comment about there's an interaction between the organic emollient and the presence of plant roots. That tends to result in improved soil structure. That's why we suspect we're seeing that sort of delayed response to the subsoil manuring. But the well, research, we going, need to keep going to be more conclusive about that. If we go over to the chat feature there, uh, Roger, it's so the next uh, one is, how much have you gone into the biological additives such as compost teas, extracts, foliar sprays, and monitoring microzyral Oh, got my tongue tied. Perform microzyle. Yep, that word. Performance in both the fungi, microzyle fungi. Performance in both the topsoil and the subsoil, as well as a difference 
impact of annuals versus perennials? Okay, so I'll go through all of them at present. Um, okay, a bit about mycorrhizal performance. So there's just been a new PhD student start at La Trobe. He's one of the things he's looking at the soil biological uh, changes occurring as a result of subsoil or soil humiliation. So he's, for example, a couple of months ago sampled our site at Tadioon. He takes soil samples back and once they can get back into the labs at La Trobe because of COVID, he'll be looking at both the sort of fungal and back, uh, bacterial uh, populations associated with those soil treatments. Uh, you've mentioned compost teas and extracts. Uh, this work was funded by the Grains Research and Development Corporation, so their interest in is looking at really large scales. So again, I sort of make the comment about whatever the organic matter is, if you're starting to apply 10 or 20 tonnes a hectare by a million hectares, you're looking at 20 million tonnes of material. So could you use composted tea? Yep, potentially, but there'd be a lot of tea drinkers, right? To, you know, we're, we're talking about this is commercial, large commercial, commercial scale sort of uh, treatment effects. Uh, Foliar sprays, uh, that waterlogging experiment I showed you with the plus or minus waterlogging, the actual nitrogen treatment there, one of our treatments was a foliar application of nitrogen as opposed to adding to the soil. And again, it, it wasn't as effective as uh, the subsoil amelioration. And the question about annuals versus perennials, uh, because the work's funded by Grains Research and Development Corporation, our focus is purely on annual cropping systems. The next question goes, thanks for that, Roger. The next question goes, how long does the improvement last for? I think you're not really sure, but either uh, with the roots spreading well, the subsoil, is it self-sustaining? There, there is a component of the project that I didn't show. Uh, one component, there's been a number of trials or demonstration level trials set up throughout Southeastern Australia. And one of them was called the Project Sextant, where they literally, it was called Project Sextant because they dug what they call the graveyard plots and added organic matter to the subsoil. That was established in the mid 1990s and colleagues in South Australia who've been sort of visually monitoring that site said there was still visible Yield, yield improvements there, what's that, 30 years later. So, but but that the residual aspect is really, that's a really important component and that's why GRDC's extended the funding initially from field trials three years to five years because that will be the deal break in terms of the economic viability of this technology. Uh, I then, suspect that because there is there does appear to be the synergistic interaction between roots and organic matter. The response should last at least several years. And just the last question uh, here is, is the timing of the application important? Obviously not if you're cropping, but if you could just want, but if you just wanted to improve the soil. Uh, well, actually from a cropping point of view, it's it's critical. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, we mentioned at commercial scale because there's quite a bit of soil disruption by putting that amount of organic matter in the soil. So what you want to do is, uh, like any soil disturbance, there's an optimal soil moisture. If you go in too dry, it's really hard soil strength. If it's too wet, you'll get smearing. So you need to have a bit of soil moisture to actually put the, ideally to put the emollient in. Once you put the emollient in, you won't have sufficient rain, rainfall to consolidate that uh, ripping zone, so you get a really good seed bed. So uh, what we try to do under commercial situations, say for example, you harvest a crop in December, or you, you'd want to ideally, in an ideal world, put that a million in, in January. So once you've harvested the previous crop to give you the maximum time before you go back into the paddock in April or May to sow the next year's crop. I suppose if you're talking from a you know, household level, yeah, it wouldn't make any difference. And can you, just a quick one's come in, can you say again how far down 
for ripping of the subsoil. So there was two different depths, wasn't there, the colleagues in the uh, north? And... That, that depended on both the machinery and the soil. So in the case of Victoria, we, we found we had, because it was done under really dry conditions and really dense clay soils, uh, we could only effectively get down to 30 centimetres. The colleagues in Tasmania, they, they get down to 50 centimetres because they had quite moist soils and colleagues in southern New South Wales, they were getting down to about 40, 45 centimetres. It's, it's probably, to answer your question, is there an ideal depth? We're not sure, but it, it, what we're doing is what was logistically feasible at a research level. Yeah. And one, one. Sorry, I'm late. Um, from um, uh, another question. I came in late, so I might already cover this. Do you get deeper root growth with subsoil meliation, and is that beneficial? And do you get deeper root growth in those ones that that were ripped deeper? Uh so I think of that graph from the RAND experiment, Southern New South Wales, there was, there was a proliferation of roots around the organic matter source. It was about 30 or 40 centimetres, so you're getting that much significantly better root growth there around that sort of the zone there compared to the control treatment. Uh, ripping per se didn't have any beneficial impact. It was where you had that a million added at depth, you got the greatest impact. You can, however, as or if you're anyone here farms in the Mallee, that there's been some work done on Mallee low rainfall sandy soils. They've have found beneficial impacts of just deep ripping without emollient, but their their soils are different in that they tend to have a traffic induced compaction layers just below the plough layer, so ripping breaks up that compaction, therefore the roots are able to access subsoil water. The, the projects I've outlined today are focused on dense clay soils and you know that, that clay con content increases with depth so and the soils are, have naturally high strength. It's not the result, there is some, yes, machinery compaction, but there are just naturally dense clay soils. So the rule of thumb is you will get no benefit or sometimes a negative, generally negative benefit if you just deep rip. I know there have been some reported cases in the high rainfall zone where you occasionally get a benefit of just deep ripping alone, but we could almost guarantee that that benefit would last no longer than one year before that soil would reconsolidate. Excellent, thanks Roger. Um, thank you for this evening, that was uh very enlightening and um, for for everyone, I'm just going I'm to uh, unmute you all and you can um, then, um, if you'd like to unmute yourselves, you can all then give uh, Roger a clap uh, and to show that there are, has actually been some people listening and participating. So if you give, yourself, give Roger a clap, that I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.